Matt Rhodes, and if you could please give your name and the capacity in which you will appear today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senators. Warren Clark, CEO of National Road Transport Association. Thank you, Mr Clark. Uh, Richard Calver, I'm an advisor with Nat Road. Thank you, Mr Calver. Now, Mr Clark, I'm going to give you the opportunity to make an opening statement. You know how this works. Yep. And this is the opportunity for you to get everything on the record that your members want us to hear. Um, again, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senators. Thanks for allowing us to come to the uh, committee. Uh, we made a, a detailed submission, seems like forever ago, back in November 2019, and we covered many, many issues. Um, and I think, you know, following the hearing of how it's gone through the process, it's pretty obvious that the transport industry has a myriad of issues that we need to deal with. Um, since we wrote the submission, we've had fires, floods, droughts, um, we've had COVID-19 and we've just had a once in a hundred year flood in March 2021. So to say that um, things for the industry have been easier since we've done it uh, is probably, you know, they haven't. The industry just struggles from, from year to year um, with various things. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about, I suppose, and it all relates to what we've been going through about cross-border issues and how things are so difficult across the country. You'd think that we were living in eight different countries. Um, through, through the pandemic, we had um, many members complaining about the cost burden of the pandemic and that you know, they had to put on extra staff to actually um, you know, run their day-to-day -day operations. So small operators in the cost of a city of $100,000 from cleaning trucks to administrative nightmares to cross-border issues. Um, the, cost, the cost to industry, I suppose, hasn't been determined yet, but obviously it's been very, very large. Like I said, one small company would estimate that it's cost them probably $100,000. Um, and, you know, this doesn't take into account the disruption to their business, to their operations dealing with um, various permits and, um, uh, various decorations they have to go through with different states. So the question that I want to ask here is why in this country can't we have the states with same, the same permits for each state? I mean, it's a pretty simple thing, but it didn't happen. Um, the increased cost and compliance burden, and this is going to be the sort of crux of my presentation really, is about the cost and the low margins that are in this industry. We estimate that there's probably a profit margin of 3%. Uh, very, very low margins where industry is continually asked to bear the cost. Um, you know, it, it's been helped, I suppose. One of the questions was, is what the, the previous, or well, the current government's done for industry. I suppose, you know, in a way it has helped with the, um, the instant asset write-off and the incentives that they put through for purchasing assets. But in the end, you've still got to have the money to actually buy these assets. So. What we'd like to do is see those incentives um, extended over time. Secondly, and probably the biggest thing that I want to touch on is the issues that our members and our industry face in relation to unfair contract conditions. Um, there, are, there are many, many examples that we could go over with unfair contracts. And one of the good examples um, that I want to use is an unre unrealistic termination clauses that are now being written into contracts. Um, the, core, the, the termination clauses being forced on the small mum and dad businesses can be as little as 30 days. So how is this possible and how is this fair for someone to purchase capital equipment worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and the payback period for this equipment might be over a number of years, yet the larger customer, the customer with the power, um, can terminate their contract within 30 days and find someone who can do it cheaper and this happens. So. For small, for small business, um, you know, people say, oh, well, they, they have a choice to take up this contract, but they, but they don't have a choice. If they don't take up the contract, they don't have work and they go out of business. So a lot of people have touched on unfair contracts, but it, it, is, it is something that we need to protect these smaller operators on, owner drivers, up to small fleets. Uh, if we don't, we're gonna lose that section of the industry and we roughly estimate that that section of the industry carries about 60% of freight. So when you think about it, it's a pretty big problem, but it still goes on. <clears throat> the, 
The answer to the issue of unfair contract terms is to, is to strengthen the current laws affecting small businesses by reinforcing that unfair contract terms should be unlawful. We want penalties and we want infringement notices to apply for unfair contract terms um, that are included in standard contracts. And it seems that the government has heard our um, appeals for this and started to act. But we urge that this committee ask the government to fast track the track this reform. The other area that I want to take into, um, or that I want to emphasise is also the length of payment terms. And I think everyone is on the same page here, except for probably some of the major ones. Um, you know, this was a part of the, the RSRT and um, when you look at it, we need, we need um, payment terms of 30 days as a maximum term. And you know, to highlight this even further, in, in the pandemic, we had major companies, large successful companies, putting more and more pressure on the smaller operators to actually push those terms out. Mr. So, Tom, sorry, larger companies, like a, larger transport companies, or the no, clients? No, so larger customers, larger the customers. Okay. Yeah, conglomerates, yeah. without saying any names. So, you know, for instance, we're doing it tough. We, we normally pay you every every month on six, or sorry, every time on sixty days. We're going to 150 days. That's what they Tough did. luck. Yeah. yeah um, so the custo our, our guys don't have a choice. Transport doesn't have a choice. They then have to accept that or they get someone else to do it. So the maximum payment period of 30 days is still too tight for some operators, but what it does, it puts a, a sense of fairness in the market. And, and as I just mentioned, like the pandemic, um, expediated the need for this requirement, I believe. So this is where the law um, could, could obtain at least one objective test, with the law saying anything beyond the 30-day period was, was deemed to be reduced to 30 days. So this approach is more, much more effective than what we've just had passed in legislation last year, where large businesses have to um, uh, advertise or have to um, notify what terms they use to pay small businesses. So in our mind, you know, whilst that legislation was great, it just doesn't go far enough. Yeah. We need to actually legislate. So stopping, stopping the abuse in payment terms is a priority for Nat Road in particular and the whole of industry. The final thing that I want to touch on um, is the area of training and it's the area of licensing. Um, it's a priority uh, you would have heard right through this inquiry the need for um, greater training and greater people coming into the industry. We, we've got an industry with driver shortages, we've got um, ageing workforce and we've got inadequate training and basically no career paths. We want young people to come into this industry, we want diversify, diversification in this industry, but we can't get it unless we start to address some of these fundamental training issues. We need a consistent and practical training program across the country that delivers capable training in this country. So we've heard earlier on this morning how we've got drivers coming in um, that can drive without proper training. So we've got to get away from the licence as being the qualification. It's not the qualification. It's the last thing you get in the end. You must be trained before you get to even looking at the licence. So we continue to work with um, Victoria in this area. They've done a lot of good work in this area. We've got stuff, well, WA's got stuff going in over there and Queensland's got things going. We've started a process in New South Wales to try and drive change, but we've got to keep pushing on it and we've all got to keep pushing on it. So we'll hear from everyone about, oh, well, there's already training, there's already driver operations certificate for, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't know one, one employer that would actually demand that as a qualification before they came, became a driver. Um, so without going into all the stuff we put in our submission, there's a host of things that have been talked about. Uh, just sitting in the room this morning, I heard a, a myriad of things that is wrong with this industry. I really applaud the Senator for getting this inquiry up. Um, it's time that transport was taken seriously in this um, environment. I think COVID showed this country that we are an essential service to the country. We're not just another road user and we need to be looked after um, to be competitive and to provide future for the small businesses in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mr. Galvin, did you wish to add anything?
No, thank no, you, Senator. That, that's fine, Ms Clark. Look, there's a number of things I want to raise with you, and you've heard the conversation going yeah. today. Um, and I couldn't, as I was talking to the previous witnesses, I didn't have the, I wouldn't use NatRose because I haven't heard you on the uh, uh, on the record. Yeah. But we were talking about the link between remuneration and safety, mm -hmm. and I'd be interested to get NatRose's opinion on that, um, and then I could close the loop on a lot of the. Okay, of the I, th ATA. I think it's pretty obvious that we were very opposed to um, the original RSRT and look, you know, we've had several conversations with the TWU since then. The issue with linking uh, remuneration with safety um, in that format, we believe was fundamentally flawed. Now, going forward, um, what would that look like? To me, that's something that we need to explore. Um, we obviously know that the system is, is broken, but how does it work going forward? So without saying whether we support it going forward, I'd really need to see what it is and I'd love to be involved in it. And I'm sure our industry would love to be involved in it. And that's what I'm saying because of the whole opportunities. When I was asked the previous uh, witnesses this morning, you know, about a body, something that, that has to have some teeth, that has to be independent, you heard Mr Ryan's um, evidence, you heard Mr McKinley's uh, evidence, uh, you heard Mr Kane's evidence. So um, is there anything that you would add to that? Like, I'm a stickler for that, that whatever has to happen must consult industry and who is industry. So do you have, Nat Rose, have anything to add to that conversation that we were having earlier on? Well, sitting and listening to that, I think that basically every single one of those speakers had something really good in their in their their talk you know there's no doubt about it you need the industry involved in it and you need you know truck drivers involved in it um you know the TWU is, is spot on with um you know how the gig economy is affecting this country we are definitely seeing it we we need to change this um we, we need to change this industry where we're just not bottom feeders and we're not going to take it anymore. The, the race to the bottom, and I hate using that terminology, has to stop. But to do that, what does this structure look like? And I think, um, you know, to put a structure in place, it's, it's got to include everyone. Um, you know, we can't have people accepting payment as, as contractors that are less than award ward rates. I mean, it, it, it's pretty simple. To me, that it's just not acceptable. So yeah. how does this continue to go on? It continues to go on because they've got a backload or, you know, they're desperate for the work or they're desperate for the money or whatever it may be. But they're the type of things we've got to address if we're going to go forward with it. So, so Mr Clark, I'd be keen to get your view of your membership and that raises the membership on this. That, and I've talked a lot about the sham contracting. I've talked a lot about um, the difference between enterprise bargaining and the award, and there's all sorts of bits and pieces in between. And I said this very clearly. There are a lot of people paying truck drivers on award. They're not, not decent people. That, that They're paying what the minimum is. Um, but when you find companies and the top of the supply chain, and I'm very keen on your view here, they know our costs. Mm, yeah. They know our costs. And they know when people, are, when, when transport companies are being squeezed, to nowadays even go under their ward, which in some circumstances can be some 36% difference in wages. Yeah. So surely your, I mean, your members would have experienced being, trying to do the right thing by their people. The majority of your small to medium enterprises treat their drivers and their forkies and all their staff like family. Mm. What's the feedback been from your members on, on this and the lack of enforcement? Yeah, so... I think the, 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 to answer in, in one word is complete frustration, I suppose. Um, you know, there's evidence out there everywhere of uh, drivers accepting jobs that are under, under award. Um, you know, we have, we have uh, and what you said is 100% right, where you've got our, our customers who's the, you know, up the tree, they know exactly what, where, what our costs are. They even know it to a level that if they get a fuel discount through an association, they carve that out of the contract rate. Right? So you sort of think to yourself, there's not a lot of room for transport to move anymore and we can't be asked to uh, complete work uh, under award rates. I mean, as you said, award rates, you know, if you've got, a, you've got a truck on top of that, you've got wages on top of that, you've got maintenance, you've got licences, you've got everything under the sun, it, you're not going to last long.
Yeah. So, so Mr. Clark, come back to which I know Nat Roads have been very heavy on, on on highlighting this, and it is the unfair contracts, and you touched on it. Yeah. And I think it would be very helpful for the committee to understand when we talk about unfair contracts. And my my shorthand's not that quick, but unrealistic termination clauses. Is that yeah. So, what you said? so let's look a bit more. What is all that about? So what did what what some of the larger corporations are putting into con, into contracts now is that okay so maybe a termination of a contract for underperformance whatever it may be yeah sure you've got to have it in there but for a guy to go out and to gear up for a contract he might have to buy a couple of trailers he might have to buy a prime mover he might have to buy whatever he might have to put someone on so the outlay could be in the vicinity of five six hundred thousand dollars or it could be more depending on the contract but what happens is is that the larger customer puts a termination clause in there for whatever reason, and they've slowly reduced. So they might have reduced it from 180 to 90 days, and now some of them are down to 30 days. So how can any small business go out and gear up to grow business to become more efficient if they can have that contract <coughs> in 30 days? They, they go to yeah. the wall. And there would be numerous examples, and I don't want any names mm. or anything like that. I understand yeah. that. But we, we heard this in Melbourne, and, and this was on the public record. Cameron Dunn from FBT, West a Transport came in and told us about one client wanting a 30% reduction, and there's only two in the area that could do it. And we're talking pneumatic trailer, uh, tankers, and you know, I mean all the specialised gear. So, so it's so to paint the picture for those that don't know the transport industry, it's not as though operators have all this gear sitting there waiting to go. No, correct. No, that's right. And and when you say termination clauses being put on, are you do you also mean like you may have signed up for thirty days, but then the client might say, "We've well, changed their mind now. It's sixty. They can do this. Is this what's happening?" Well, that the sort of thing? Yeah, I'm not sure on that exact example, oh, okay. but but what happens with some of the unscrupulous ones is that they'll put it out for a price, okay, whatever the price may be, and then someone will come in and go, well, look, we can do that cheaper, then they'll find a reason just to terminate their contract in 30 days. Yeah. That's that's a, that's a main problem. Now, Mr Clark, I do... Yeah. Oh, sorry, Mr Clark, please. Um, we do contract assessments at Nat Road for members. Contract and one, assistance? Contract assessments. Yep. assessments. So we, the member sends it in and we give them advice. Um, one contract from a very large customer we've seen recently is for a five-year term, but one-sided in that the customer can terminate that contract on notice of 30 days. So right. the contract requires right. the transport company to use the livery of the customer to pay for and install the technology of the customer and to gear up, as Warren said, yet if, you, if they don't like the way you're administering the contract, they can give you 30 days notice, that five-year term is meaningless and they lose that investment. And, that's that, and that has happened. Right, so help me out. What is the fix? I know you said the government's got to go further. So what is actually the fix? Because see, in this station, anything can be done with the flick of a pen and the will. Well, the, the un unfair contracts legislation at the moment um, doesn't have, per se, infringements. So, in other words, you've got to go to court um, and then the court can make that particular provision void. What we want is certain classes of contract terms to be notified in statute as unfair and therefore, if you put them in your contract, once the ACCC has done an investigation into your industry, then you can get fined and that will be of no effect. Right, so okay. making them unlawful is what we're on set in this um, right. opening address. And, and that's, the that's what we want the government to um, legislate. Now, they've, they announced in November 2020 that the second half of this year, exposure draft legislation to that effect would be introduced. Um, we would like that process accelerated. Um, and also, where at the moment the upfront price, price payable under the contract has to be no more than 300000 or a million if the contract is for more than 12 months, we want that threshold taken away. So, so a more generalised unfair contract principle, Senator. And have you had the opportunity to speak to the, to the ministers? Or the we, minister? we had a consultation with Treasury. They put out a discussion paper yep. about how the law should change, and we've done a large number of submissions on this issue um, and spoken mostly to Treasury officials, yes. Okay, and is there any planned meeting further up the train, do you, 
do you envisage if they hinted that the industry may? Have, so this is for all industry, but this is yes. the transport industry. Well, this so. is for all industries, um, yeah, and right. we, we've lobbied um, for the things that Warren spoke about to, to have one of the objective criteria by which contractors would be unfair to be if you. Um, put in your contract, payment terms will be beyond 30 days. So if that's in the provision, that immediately it has reread and deemed to be 30 days. So you can have objective criteria like that in the legislation. You could have it just for transport, um, or you could have it um, across the board. Sure. And that would achieve the objects of the payment disclosure legislation that currently is in place, but we think is it effectual for the reasons that Warren indicated. Right, and, and we know that the, no, I'll, I'll guess here and I'll get pulled up if I'm wrong, but the majority of owner drivers, they don't have this luxury of even a contract. Is that your, is that your experience? Yeah. Take it or leave it. Yeah, yeah, take it or leave it. And would you envisage in the uh, fair contracting sort of sphere that, that this could be shaped for owner drivers as well? Am I, am I using the right technology over here in the Eastern Seaboard? Yeah. The, the man who owns the truck, or the woman who owns the truck. Yeah. I mean, look, as you know, most of the, well, a lot of the freight is not done on a contract. You know, yeah. come and pick up this pallet, go get that pallet. Yeah. But, you know, we need to protect our, our small businesses. Yep. So what does that look like if it means you've got a contract and in that contract there's a standard terms on how it's got to be delivered and, and so forth, then that's a benefit to owner-operators. I mean, it's not yeah. that they don't have to sit down and, and read it through each time. You know, it could be as simple as a map and printing it out and, you know, with their quote and their invoice and off they go. Yep. So, 100%. Which is why we want a code um, under the um, competition and consumer legislation for the transport industry. So right. it has those standard form terms and we've, we've been lobbying for that um, since at least 2016. Uh, and um, we keep putting that forward to government. We put it, that forward in our submission uh, to you, Senator. Mm. Yeah, mandatory. Mandatory code. Because we know this industry will never do it if it doesn't have to. So there's a couple of things I do want to raise with you before I lose you, Mr Clark and Mr Kelber. And look, there's an old hoary chestnut here, and I just thought about this. I've got to raise this. A lot of conversations been coming up in the in, in the course of this uh, inquiry that, and I know the intent, how awards were set for kilometre rates and all, and this has been one we've been battling about for years. But what we what has come very clear lately is the exploitation of the kilometre rate. And I know that I've sat there and we've negotiated kilometre rates because then it's been backed up by if you get caught, there's alley and all that sort of stuff. Have Nat Roads done some work on that lately as to how that's been exploited? And as you know, you know, we argue about average speeds and all this sort of stuff. But what we are hearing is there's so many examples where there's so much unpaid work where companies are expected delivery, 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 pick up, pick up, pick up, and then the drivers aren't getting paid for that, the contractor isn't getting paid for it. Have you had some conversation around that? Well, we, we believe it's an issue of enforcement and mm. it, it, the award needs to be better enforced. The issue is that there is an underlying safety net in the long distance award so that there's a minimum fortnightly payment rate in the award. Uh, I think it includes 16.1 of the long distance award. And the award sets that um, as a basis below which you should not um, pay your drivers. Sure. And that award provision um, needs to be enforced more. The other issue is that under the long distance award for every month of employment, you accrue one RDO, um, which can either be taken or paid out at the time you take annual leave. So that also needs to be better enforced. Uh, we're in constant touch with the Fair Work Ombudsman about the interpretation of the award and about enforcement, um, but those two issues ensuring that the minimum fortnightly guarantee payment is adhered to and ensuring that RDOs are taken uh, is a constant communication right. and enforcement um, me mechanism that should be in yeah, place. Yeah, of course it should, yeah, because, you, yeah, that's right. Your members are losing out, good members are losing out to other people that aren't doing that. Okay, so now there's a couple of other things. Senator Hanson, you still there? She will... Yes, I am, oh. here. No, oh. I am listening. 
I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to know if you want some time, because you know what I'm like, I'll go off all day. No, 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 I'm fine. I'm, I'm really taking it in and listening to the evidence that's given, yeah. Thank, thanks, Senator Hanson. Thank now, you. Thank, I want to come to another um, pet of Nat Rhodes recently. If I could say pet, I shouldn't say that. And I was fortunate enough to hear your and see your presentation at the Brisbane Truck Show before COVID got us a couple of years ago. And the, um, the commitment and dedication from Nat Rhodes on training was very uplifting, I must say that. So, um, and I know we tried to get some conversations going, Mr Clark, here in this, uh, in this building with the Minister relevant at the time. How has that progressed? Um, so, for the benefit of everyone, um, basically what we wanted to see was um, we wanted uh, driving to be an essential um, job, task, and then we wanted an apprenticeship on the, on the back of that of um, truck driving, OK? So, with that comes a clear career path. This is how you come into the industry, you do your apprenticeship, become a driver, one of the ways, not every way, but then you work your way up through the industry. So the to change that is a very difficult task. Um, we've probably hit a brick wall on that where um, it's something we haven't given up on. Um, you know, we've made every possible person known about known to us that you know this is what the industry would like to see is some form of apprenticeship, traineeship that gives clear clear career paths. In the meantime, we still have a driver shortage, um, which we work again with um, Victoria on and and others about getting in qu quality training to deliver drivers that can actually drive these vehicles and then get their license. Um, I think I heard someone talk about, you know, uh, drivers coming in from overseas. At the very minimum, those drivers should be doing that training course to make sure that we, they can drive the truck. Yeah. Uh, actually, it was about dipping headlights and stuff like that. I mean, uh, it's just unbelievable, honestly. So we're still, we're still pushed with it. We want to get it across all states. We want consistency across the country, though. But we see it as essential. Like, this is an essential service to this country and it, it actually held us up through COVID. We need to take it serious and we need to get people with clear career paths into this industry so that, you know, we can compete with other countries, we can keep the country going. And by the way, you make a good living and you get home safely at night. Yeah, and just, just for the public record, this committee did inquire into road safety a number of years ago and it was the time when the B-double, the uh, Scots yep. B-double, or KNS, I think the Scott Speed Double was wedged under the M4, or didn't quite get wedged under the M5, I think it was. And part of one of the recommendations was that we should not allow foreign drivers, I'm just saying this because it's on the record, that if foreign drivers come here, they need to do the Australian testing and be assessed and all that, and it was just ignored. So we did try that. Yeah. But in, coming back to, um, same government, by the way, but anyway, coming back to um, the apprenticeship style, traineeship stroke, whatever it may be, and, and I know I've been very critical in this country, it's too easy to get a licence, but we have a massive gap here, Mr Clark, and I know yeah. you've done some work around this, um, in terms of we expect kids to leave 17, to leave school at 17, and yet we don't want them to lay them. Yeah. Now, tell us about the work that Rose have done around that. So what we've done there is, I mean, to get people into the industry, I mean, traditionally over the years, you drove the, went in the truck with your father or your uncle or whoever it may yeah. be, and they became <clears> interested in the industry. So now what we want is we want, well, the work that we've done is around, OK, what do we need to do to get these people in the industry and how do we get them involved and what training and what career paths have we got going. But the problem that we found what's holding it all up is that everything is tied to the licence. And um, my colleague in Victoria will tell you that over the last 30 years, we're on now on our third inquiry into the licensing system and the training <laughs> system and nothing's changed. So if you want to be, if you're a really good, solid, young person who wants doesn't want to go to university, doesn't want to be a lawyer. A lot of these guys want to come into this industry and drive trucks and you know, be involved in heavy machinery, whatever it may be. But the problem is the gap from when they leave school to when they can actually get their licence, they're gone. They're off, they're in another industry, they're doing something else and we can't get them back. So what we're saying is that the training should be tied, sorry, the licence should be tied to the training, not the other way around. So if you're, a, if you're a pea plater in New South Wales, you do, I think it's 120 hours, 
And that's all the training you have to do right through up until you get your, your heavy, you know, your mod accommodation. It's just a matter of time that you hold that licence. So I think what's been seen in the past, sorry, getting off the track a little bit there, but... No, no, you're right, at least the licensing, because we thought we were doing the right thing yeah. in the early 2000s by trying to harmonise with all this. You've got to do X amount of time before you can go HR. That's and right. And then MCHC, and, you know. Yeah. And I think, HC, MC, I to touch sorry. on the foreign drivers, you know, it's been seen that they come in and they solve the issue because we've got all these people over here that want to come in the country and they can drive a truck and we put them in a truck and off they go and they can't drive them. We've got to really look at our training and it's got to be quality training. And, it, and an apprenticeship, you go, OK, that's a long time, four years as an apprentice. Well, maybe we've got to change the apprenticeship, and this is the work that we did, that it's slightly different to a four-year apprenticeship. Maybe it's, maybe it's not called an apprenticeship, maybe it's a traineeship you know, where we have supervised training, you know, we have um, systems where these drivers can come in, they can, sorry, these young people can come in, they can be supervised on the job training. And maybe it's over a period of two years. But then you've got the ordinary driver or, or the guy that's, you know, he doesn't want to do an apprenticeship. He actually wants to come in the industry. There's practical training. It fills that gap. Um, we did work into about, OK, what about the guy that's been in there for 30 years? You know, he can back a, a multi-combination vehicle, you know, into whatever. You know, what about that guy? He's got no training. OK, well, you know, we can then, um, we can then have qualifications for those guys that have been in the industry for a long time. They just upskill a tiny little bit, they've got the same qualification or better. Yep. So, yeah. All right. So my last one, because I'm mindful of the time, but uh, in terms of the earlier evidence you've heard, you've heard for calling of a dedicated minister for transport, you've heard witnesses calling for, um, I forget the wording, um, industry board, uh, you know, consultative committees and all that. So, and we've heard others have regular contact with the minister. Mm. Have that raised the ability, and I know states would be different, but let's talk about both because we're... we're, we're we're bypassing it. Um, how's the engagement with state ministers? Um, state, state ministers for us, yeah. we engage on a um, as needed basis. I mean, a lot of the, our, our organisation is a national organisation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, most of our membership is in New South Wales, Victoria. Um, we engage on the state ministers as required. Um, the, so in Victoria, I mean, look, VTA does a tremendous job down there. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of niche areas that we deal in with Victoria. So, you know, we've got access to the, all the ministers in various states. Um, when it comes to a, a designated minister for transport, I mean, look at the size of this industry. Wouldn't it be good if we had a designated minister for transport? You know, we've got some pretty small sectors that got designated ministers without naming them. But, you know, this is a... This is a multi-billion dollar industry that is vital to this country. Um, it's, it's a big job, just on its own. And in terms of Nat Road's engagement with the Commonwealth, is, it, uh, um, is there a set body that you are representative of your members on? Um, no, I think our engagement with the Commonwealth is directly to the Minister's office or the Minister. Um, we did suggest once, like, so for instance, in New South Wales, there's a, a road freight industry council where industry all sits and talks with government and mm. and, and uh, the minister. So that sort of thing with the federal um, side of things would be would be you know really good. Yeah. So it's the minister talking directly with industry yeah. and drivers and other government officials about transport issues. Hard to see the downside when we're... I mean, the GDP figure changes all the time, and I know it ranges from 8 or 9% for road transport, transport all up 12, is that right? Some of them? Yeah, it's something like that, yeah. All right, well, Mr Clark, I'm, I'm very mindful of time. Thank you so much for your time today, Mr Calper, and I will ask the ATO how that's all going, because I'll be pretty keen to hear what their answer is there. So keep chipping away. Thank you very much for um, coming here today. We know where to find you, should we need to follow up. Yep, now we'll go to our next um, witnesses, the Australian Livestock and Rural Transporters Association.